Welcome to our YouTube live and we'll be together for an hour and um, yeah I think I think at the moment if I was to kind of summarize what's going on in the markets I'd say probably yields are what's spooking people at the moment because we've seen US yields spike upwards we've seen UK yields spike upwards and it's at the long end of the curve previously everything was at the short end as the central banks were hiking now it seems that we've got some term premium at last you know we're getting an extra bit of return for taking that duration risk which isn't necessarily a bad thing it's just the rate at which those yields are rising which has caused a degree of alarm so there's been a lot of discussion of that recently so we can talk about that that could be one of our topics tonight and um, I see in the UK that Metro Bank shares have just plunged uh, it looks like it's going to have to recapitalise itself. It's one of the challenger banks in the UK and that looks pretty alarming. I wonder if there'll be a run on Metro Bank uh, in the next few days, possibly. Um, and of course, uh, we've seen energy prices increasing. So we could get this secondary inflation spike, which has got lots of people worried too. So... I'd say that kind of summarises where we are right now. And risky assets haven't done particularly well over the last month or so as a result of these fears. High yields, the Fed higher for longer potentially. And I'd say the kind of narrative has shifted from one of a soft landing to more of a probability of a US recession or the possibility of a US recession. I think people are putting more faith into the yield curve inversion um, where short end, the short end of the curve has higher yields than the long end. More weight is being put on that as a predictor of recession because it has inverted a bit more recently. So that's, um, that's the uh, kind of two minute summary of what's going on in markets right now. And that's kind of front of mind for most people who are investing at the moment. And... Yeah, so I'd, I'd say, you know, please do like, please do subscribe, please do share this with other people. My colleague Laura tells me that people do share. Um, so please do, because it helps us a great deal. And it's, um, who knows, your friends might find our content interesting. And yeah, also, I've just had my flu jab. So um, I'm now being controlled by the World Economic Forum. Just so you know, I thought I should warn you about that. Um, yeah, so uh, you have an hour with me. You can ask any question you want. If you're one of our supporters on YouTube, we'll push your question to the front of the queue. If you super chat, it costs you a little bit to do that. You choose how much you pay. Again, we'll push your question to the front of the queue. So please do that. And I've also gone for the high risk strategy with my drink again. It's Fanta. So I may well choke. No. Okay. Not that swig anyway. Brilliant. Okay, okay. Haven't seen from you, um, a message from you for a while. That's kind of you. Um, um, super chat immediately. Thank you. Um, there was something else I had to say. Yes, yes. Let me just show you this. Um, our podcast for this week was a kind of interesting one, um, which I did with my co-host, uh, Michael. Michael Pugh. Let me just show you uh, Many Happy Returns is the name of the podcast. And I'll share this with you so you can see it. But it was about small caps because what's interesting about small caps at the moment is I bought them. I bought a small cap fund a while ago because it was cheap. And I just accidentally noticed it was cheap, US small caps. And um, it hasn't really rallied. In fact, it's fallen further. But the whole podcast episode is about buying small caps and why it can be a difficult buy because they are quite volatile, they're cyclical, you know, when there's a recession, the, the prices fall. The best time to buy them is just as the market, is, is just as the economy reaches its kind of low point and starts recovering. Of course, you don't know exactly when that is or anywhere near where that is. But that's the kind of low point at which you want to buy because they tend to do well during economic recoveries. 
better than the broad market, in fact. Let me just share that with you. Can I? Yes. Here we go. So this is the um, episode I'm talking about. Small caps are cheap. Why do they keep getting cheaper? So that's the latest podcast. So have a listen to that. It's quite informal. People tell me they like the podcast because they laugh out loud when they when they watch it. So it makes uh, the bitter pill of finance a little bit easier to take, maybe. Anyway, let's turn to your questions now and see what we've got. McCready747, nice to see you. Um, Tom's Personal Finance, talking about small caps, I think. There we go. Okay, yeah, so let's get Laura's document. And she says, there's a super chat. And it's um, KK. If you could choose between TLT or GLD right now, 10% of portfolio, so that's my fund portfolio, KK knows me well. I wouldn't take too much of a gamble on either. What would you choose? All the best, sir. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the super chat. Um, I think at the moment, gold, if we take a look at gold, because it's kind of interesting if you look at the valuation of it, because I've seen some stuff about this too recently, um, which is a bit misleading, I think. Because uh, people have pointed out that yields are rising and usually when yields rise, gold falls. Um, so let's have a look at our fundamental value model, because what I've built is a very simple gold and silver pricing model. And this is simply an explanatory model. It's not a predictive model. It just looks at the current price of gold. Oh, hello. Come on in. Come on. Come on. Ted, Ted, Ted. Come on. Good boy. You, you want the treat. Oh, he came himself today. Normally the biltong downstairs is a much better draw. There you go, mate. Yeah, so I've done a fundamental model of gold and silver. And what goes into it is the same for both models. The regression parameters are slightly different for the two. Um, let me just share that with you so you can see what the current forecast is. Come on. Shiny's just getting powered up. Ah, right, here we go. This is it. So let me make it a little bit bigger. Right, so gold, currently, the price of gold is about oh, $1,800, $1,822. The model tells us it should be like something like 1732 So it is a little bit overvalued, I'd say, by about 5%. But what goes into this model is the level of inflation, because commodities, all commodities keep up with inflation, almost all commodities do, but also the value of the dollar, the trade weighted dollar, because strong dollar means weak gold, weak dollar means strong gold, so um, when the dollar strengthens it tends to reduce the value of gold, which is denominated in dollars, as all commodities are. And then finally real interest rates, because it's a wasting asset, gold doesn't pay you an income, when income is high, that tends to make gold less attractive. Because if you've got a choice between a 10-year treasury or a one-year treasury that's paying you 4% and carrying almost no credit risk, very little duration risk, um, you compare that with gold, which is paying you zero, well, you'd prefer the thing which is almost zero volatility with a 4% guaranteed return. Wouldn't you, Ted? Ted would. He's a sensible cockapoo. So there we go. Um, so currently, roughly in line with um, the model. And then if we look at uh, silver, yeah, different coefficients, but the same inputs. And that's showing us that um, it's overvalued by about 8%. So, you know, that's silver and gold. So at the moment, you know, would I be buying gold? Probably not based on this, based on the value of the dollar right now based on CPI inflation over the recent over recent history and um, based on the value of the dollar, uh, the Dixie index. Yeah, probably less attractive than TLT. Whereas TLT, let's have a look at the yield on 
the US Treasury. It's right now. So this is COIFIN. And if we look at the 20 year, well, the 30 year, it's currently 4.9%. But notice how rapidly that yield is increasing. So what you could do is say, well, you know, I'll put it off for a little bit um, if I think yields are going to go a bit higher. But look at these at these rates, that's looking pretty attractive. In fact, at the moment, what I'm doing is all of my fixed income, or as much of it as I can, I'm doing via single government bonds. I can't buy US treasuries. I can't even buy the ETFs issued by by um, BlackRock, by iShares, which is just a, like a thin wrapper around single treasuries. Why would I do that? Why would I buy single government bonds? It's because that way you won't make a capital loss. Even if the yields go up further, you'll be locking in a yield today of whatever, 4.9% of 5% for the two year, 5.4% for the one year. And you know exactly what you're going to get pretty much to the penny and when you're going to get it. So you would not enter that at a negative yield. And you know that you'll get annualised about 5.4% if you lock in by buying a one-year US Treasury right now. So the beauty of holding to maturity, where you control when you sell or whether you sell, is that you know what yield you'll get. Whereas with a portfolio, which is effectively what you've got, a bond portfolio, if you buy TLT, it's 20-year plus duration maturity treasuries, US treasuries. You've got no control over when those are sold. And if there's a capital loss, if yields rise, the price of the bonds will fall inside the fund. The fund will fall. And because it's got such long duration, then it'll take a big hit. So let's have a look at TLT just to see um, that in action. So here's TLT. And what should we look at? We'll look at the price and volume. So this is the TLT ETF. Um, so you can see that oh, I'll take off the uh, moving averages. That's not very helpful. Uh, you can see that very marked fall recently as yields have been rising at the long end of the curve. Um, and it's about 15% over the last month or so. So pretty chunky. And I wouldn't be surprised if it, if yields carried on rising. Um, because if, if people are expecting inflation to, to spike again with energy prices rising, and let's look at um, crude oil, this is what has people worried. The price of crude oil certainly surged upwards. It almost touched the target for um, Saudi Arabia and Russia and OPEC Plus, which was apparently $100. But now it is starting to drop quite quite markedly. But if, if it carries on rising, if it resumes its upward movement, then we could get a secondary inflation spike. That means higher rates for longer. That means that we could get um, potentially the Fed holding its rates there for some time. And we could be talking a whole year, you know, maybe even longer, depending on how long inflation lasts. Um, so I think those are the worries. Um, but, but when I buy TLT or gold, I think I'd probably buy TLT right now. If I had the choice, I'd buy a single US treasury. Uh, but unfortunately, I can't do that as a UK investor. But if I had the ability to, I'd choose something like one of these iBonds products. Um, unfortunately, I can't buy them. I can't buy these either. But if we had these in the UK, something like a sterling hedged high bond fund, yeah, that would make sense. But these kind of mature like a bond. They've got a fixed maturity date, so you can hold them to maturity. They go back to par. That's the critical thing. And you don't have to lock in a loss. That's the beauty of it. Um, and they pay out 100 at maturity. So that's why I think they're kind of cool. I wish we had these in the UK, actually, for gilts, but... You know, um, BlackRock, BlackRock doesn't listen to me. So, <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, given the choice, I'd probably go for uh, GLT. And um, that would be my choice. 
TLT because that would be my choice. Okay, so next question is let's choose someone here. Daniel Brown's got a nice unicorn. I like that. Uh, Faraz Hussein says hello. Hello, Faraz. Um, the compounding investor says hello. Uh, do you think we're going to go back to the 60 year average forward P S and P 500? Yeah, eventually. Let's have a look at it. Yardini S and P 500 forward P. Here we go. Thank you, Yardini. I always feel as if I should say a little prayer of thanks to Ed Yardini for publishing this stuff. Um, here we go. And yeah, let's look at the forward P for the US. And it hasn't got the 60 year average. I think it has got more history. Yeah, so it goes back to Yeah, it goes back to 1982. The shaded areas that you can see here, those are bear market declines for the S&P 500 of 20% or more. Um, so we had one in 2000, we had one in 2007, 2022, um, with the tech wreck. And yeah, the forward PE 16 times is the kind of long term average. Do I think we're going back there? Well, we're not too far off it not right now. It's 16.5. Um, but I guess, yeah, let's have a look up at the top here. Because this shows you the small caps as well. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah, here we go. So 17.7 uh, is the, yeah, that would have been median for individual stocks perhaps. But for the... Um, S&P 500, I guess this is the weighted average um, forward P. It's 17.7. So not a mile off 16. Uh, would we go back to it? Yeah, it's just a question of when. Because the whole point of valuation measures is that they're mean reverting. This is something I'm always saying, which is that, yeah, uh, people will sometimes have exuberance. They'll pay, you know, $22, $23 for every dollar of profit. Uh, sometimes they'll pay $24 for every dollar of profit, as they did in 1999. But eventually, and this isn't because of some universal law, it's just an empirical observation, the typical forward PE, the amount people are willing to pay for every future dollar of profit, is $16 today. Um, and yeah, I think we're going to go back there. And when it's at $22 or $24, notice that the mean reversion pushes the price of the index down, unless you get massive earnings growth, in which case it kind of justifies the high price. But what we're not seeing right now is huge profit growth for the S&P as a whole. We're seeing an earnings recession at the moment. So maybe we'll go back to reasonable earnings growth. But at the moment, we're seeing three successive quarters of year-on-year -year falls in profit for the S&P 500 as a whole. So, yeah, I think we'll probably go back to 16 times. Higher interest rates are certainly not helping. The spike in energy prices is not helping. The strategic petroleum reserve is down to, I think, about 17 days of supply. So even if oil prices spike, uh, the ability of the US to iron out that spike by releasing those petroleum reserves is limited. It only has 17 days of supply left. Um, so I think this could be a problem. And this point I was making about small caps, if you look at those, those are only 12 times forward earnings right now, which is pretty low. And you can see it has been falling recently as well. I think I bought it when it was somewhere around here. Uh, I think I bought it in March earlier this year. So it is down a bit, but you know, I'm willing to hold that for a couple of years. But you can see the US small caps are cheap. Nobody wants small caps. All of the narrative and the buzz is around those mega cap eight tech stocks where it's all about AI. So even in the tech wreck, 
the phoenix that arose from the tech wreck ashes was was that AI was going to save us. Well, um, personally, I don't really buy into that narrative completely. Um, and it has pushed up valuations, and I think probably a little bit too much. So there we are. You know, that's the uh, forward PE. And I think we're probably going back to 16 times, yeah. Um, Oh, interesting. Somebody called JW says a TLT relative to SPY relative strength chart is probably useful to keep an eye on when to buy TLT as to when TLT outperforms. Yeah, so this would be the TLT index relative to the S&P 500. Um, and somebody says, thank you for the content, Roman. A good idea to switch from default PMC multi-asset fund three. Uh, with LNG pension. This is supplementary to DB pension. Thinking performance, but also mansion house reforms. Um, yeah, I think um, oh, there was another super chat. Thank you, Anton. I'll come to you in a sec. Um, switch from the multi-asset fund three. Let's see if I can find that. Because I'm not familiar with that fund, I don't think. PMC multi-asset fund three what an intriguing name is elgin legal and general investment management and our share so the fee for that is 0.13 it gives you long-term investment growth and it's multi-asset as you say and 40 to 85 percent share so pretty broad band of of, of, of the equity bond split um, you know I think that's not not necessarily a bad fund um, it is actively managed by the look of it but it is a uh, fairly low fee very low fee for an actively managed fund but would I switch out of it probably not you know if you're comfortable with the way it's managed and with the performance then you know I don't see a necessarily a, a good, really good reason to switch away from it um, let's go back to your comments and just see what you were switching into. Uh, this is supplementary to a DB pension. Okay, so I assume the performance hasn't been very good, which is why you're talking about switching away from it. Multi-asset funds generally, the benchmark is Vanguard. So you'd look at the percentage stocks and bonds. You'd match it up with the right life strategy fund or even a mixture of life strategy funds to get the exact percentage of equities, equity and bonds split and then you'd compare the returns that way because there isn't a multi-asset um, index which has bonds and stocks in it I'd say life strategy is the, actually the closest thing to it so you know I'd compare the returns with that based on the equity bond split but if you're not happy with that then would you switch away to um, something else I mean you could do your own right you could do your own equity bond split you could do global stocks global bonds with the same equity bond split um, but I'm not convinced that the mansion house reforms are going to make a huge difference simply because this government is unlikely to survive beyond May of next year and then we'll just have to see what Labour decides to do uh, with their reforms these things could take a while to roll back but Really, they haven't made any huge changes yet. Um, but forcing UK funds to invest in UK companies, I think, for defined benefit pensions, is a pretty ugly thing to do. You really shouldn't force fund managers to do that. There is a problem with not enough buying of UK stocks, but I don't think that's the way you solve it. I think a better solution would be to get rid of things like transaction taxes, which are kind of ridiculous and regressive and I don't think very helpful. Um, you know, that would probably be a better incentive. Uh, so tax incentives, yeah, but forcing companies to buy UK fund, UK stocks, I think is a mistake. But we'll just have to see what those reforms mean. But would I switch out of that fund? Probably not, personally. You know, I'm not advising you to do anything, um, but I'm just saying that would be my, my take on it. And it looks like a reasonable fund, reasonable fees. And um, yeah, we'll see. Right, so 
Next question is from Anton, who gave us a super chat. Thank you, Anton. What do you think about your B box investment now? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was looking at it recently, actually. It is a bit depressing. So this is in my fund portfolio because I was looking for stuff that had sold off sharply because um, I like buying, you know, I like certain things. And um, so the, the, the kind of justification for buying this, if you look at my investor's journal, because I do keep one, the justification for buying Big Box was that it actually provides... Um, if you ever drive down the motorway, the freeway in the UK, um, you'll often see these huge storage warehouses by the side of the motorway. And those are leased to these companies like Amazon, but also many other um, online retailers in the UK by a company called Tritax Big Box. And so if the, as long as there's growth in demand for those products, and these are consumer discretionary products, if there's a recession, there's going to be a pull down on on sales but as long as economic uh, activity is okay and people carry on the trend of doing more online shopping then Tritax Big Box would probably be in good shape uh, so that's why I like it uh, and it completely dominates this space um, in terms of creating these large storage centers and renting them out to to e-commerce companies like Amazon so let me just show you the share price for um, for Tritax. Let me make this a bit bigger. There is a European version as well. And you can see it's a bit of a train wreck. So the net asset value is a light green line because remember this is a closed-ended fund and uh, it's, it's a real estate investment trust and there's a catastrophic fall. I think I bought at about this point um, or maybe in March and really hasn't moved much. It's just been trading sideways. What I do like about it is the dividend. So if you look at the dividend yield, make this bigger. The dividend yield is uh, the forecast dividend yields about five percent. So not a huge dividend, but a reasonable dividend. So you know I've been receiving that, um, which I'm quite happy with. Looks like it pays out uh, quarterly. So you know I've received a few of those dividends while I wait for it to kind of recover. But, you know, the UK is not in a great state economically. Uh, growth has been weak, and that's going to weigh on the business that the companies to whom Tritax leases its spaces, their their profits will, will suffer as a result of weak activity and weak economic growth. But um, if we look at the actual income statement, you can see that it was pretty bad in 2022, of course. Um, but then 2023, hopefully, will be a bit better. Let's have a look at the quarterly if they've got it. They haven't. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, that's what I'd be concerned about, is the economic um, growth in the UK. But am I happy with it? Yeah, I'm still quite happy with it. I'm not going to sell it, and I'm willing to hold on to it for some time. And like I say, you know, with a 5% dividend yield... I'm happy to earn that over time with a share price that kind of doesn't move. But eventually I suspect that the share price will start to improve again, simply because this is a, a, a kind of long term trend in the UK. that We get more uh, shopping online rather than in physical stores and they're going to benefit from that trend. So that was my justification for buying it. The justification's still there and so I'm not going to sell. But that would be my reason for not selling. I'm not overjoyed with, <laughs> with the fact that it hasn't risen in price. But, you know, fortunately, I bought it after the share price had fallen quite a bit. I think I took a 20% hit uh, rather than the full whack, clearly. That would have been much worse. So that's my take. Uh, back to me and your questions. Look, I'm going to risk it, sip Fanta. No joke, good. So back to your questions. 
So I should remind you, please do like, subscribe. You can do a power hour to me. It's like this, except it's just you and me and Teddy, obviously. Um, so if you do want coaching, I provide that. Go to our website. You can see more about it. We also have a community so that you can uh, join our one our calls every other week on a Sunday evening. And it's like this, except your question will definitely get answered. We get through everybody's question usually. Um, lots of members only content and you get access to a chat application so that you can chat to the community, chat to me anytime you like. And I kind of throw in lots of tidbits on the on the Slack forum, uh, which is currently what we use as the chat application as well. Um, so back to your questions. Let's have a quick scoot through. Um, Phil Curtis says B box, Tritax Big Box is writing down its assets a little. That's a little worrying. If I was to buy it, it's trading around 26% below book value. So again, you know, for a, for a closed ended fund, if it's trading at a discount, assuming its net asset value is calculated correctly, then you know that you're buying a bargain unless those assets get written down again. And the difficulty, I think, is how do you price a warehouse, you know, one of these colossal warehouses next to the motorway? You can't really price it because it doesn't have a secondary market. It doesn't trade every day like Exxon stock does or big box stock, stock does. So you can't really know what it's worth. And that's always a difficulty with the illiquid investments. Their true worth is unknown. So when you're working out the net asset value, it's kind of a, you know, guess, really, to be honest. Yeah, but I think the overall trend, the profitability, you know, all of that I'm fairly happy with. Um, Roger Duke, good question. Are we in for a flat decade in the markets? Interesting you should say that because if you do look at the valuations in the US now, we just did in fact, it's 17.7 .7 times forward earnings. Now, if we were at 23, 24, 25, that usually reduces future returns because it just shows exuberance in the markets. People are just getting carried away with a narrative, whether it's AI, growth, tech, whatever. Oh, you perked up. Um, but I think, you know, with valuations where they are now, you know, 17.7 .7 isn't so high. So I think probably a 10 year uh, flat decade is a bit too pessimistic, I think, you know, my core portfolio, I should always say, is in 100% global equity, and that's not going to change. I don't kind of fiddle around with it. My fund portfolio is for things like Tritax Big Box, TLT. You know, I've just built a portfolio out of single stocks to uh, try and find super stocks, you know, small cap value, growth, quality, momentum, all combined into one <laughs> into one portfolio. So I just did a video on that. Um and I used, oh, Teddy, and I used Stockopedia um, in order to do the filter. Uh, anyway, there's a video about that if you're interested. There's no more, mate. You're going to be sick. You had too many of these treats. You had three this morning. There's no more. No more. Come on, down, down. I don't know. Christ. I can't believe he eats so many of those things. Anyway, yeah, try tax. Um, but for that decade, uh, probably not. You know, I think, oh, he's been summoned. He's going to get his built on. Um, flat decade, a bit too pessimistic, I think. Um, I think it's unlikely we're going to see a flat decade. That's very unusual to have a whole decade with no growth. Um, so I think that's unlikely. And if you actually look at the earnings, they are starting to pick up again for the S&P 500. So what's more likely, I think, is that we will get a slow resumption of earnings growth. There'll be a correction for the kind of AI narrative, which I think people are still hugely overpaying for. So stocks like NVIDIA will probably re-rate downwards, as will Amazon and others. The Mega Cap 8, Mag Mega Cap, or the Magnificent 7, as it's now called. And then, you know, we'll go back to kind of steady earnings growth. And I think, you know, that means re real return of about five or six percent per year for the next decade. You know, I think um, 
yeah, I think I think at the moment valuations aren't as crazy as they were, so that's good. Um, but I think there's still a little bit of weakness ahead, and simply because valuations are still a bit high, and you can feel the fear in the markets right now. They are spooked by yields, and that's not good. And oil as well, so that's not um, good over the short term. But you know, long term, I think. I still wouldn't worry about holding global indices. Um, Phil Curtis says, uh, I guess this is still about big box. Do you find using basic technical analysis, 200 day moving average helps you when picking an entry point into a stock alongside the financial statements? It's something I've been learning recently. Not really. Um, I mean, I'd always compare the price to earnings. Price to earnings is interesting. For a, for a closed-ended fund, I'd look at the discount to NAV, if you believe the NAV, which I usually do, uh, if you if you kind of think it's a plausible NAV. Um, so it would tick that box. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, those are the things I'd look at. The price history is kind of interesting, but I'd never use a 200-day moving average. No, I don't think that's very useful um, personally. I just don't find it useful or any kind of technical analysis for that matter. Um, uh, let's see what else we've got here. McCready, here we go. A super chat from McCready747. <laughs> okay. Politics, here we go. Do you really think Labour will be in number 10 next year? Well, I think barring a miracle, uh, yeah, because... I think I think the problem at the moment in the UK is that um, if you look at the pandemic, what it's been very good for is changing governments. You know, any government that was in charge during the pandemic usually has been has fallen by the wayside or is kind of hated. And what was remarkable was that the Conservative Party got re-elected even after that pandemic. Um, so have a look at Laura Koonsberg's series, which is the political, she was the political editor for the BBC. And uh, she's done, I think she called it the decade of chaos, something like that, um, or the years of chaos. And uh, yeah, brilliant documentary. If you've got access to the BBC on iPlayer, uh, it's really interesting. And what is interesting is that even after being re-elected, they then did that ridiculous mini budget, which was frankly, I was ashamed. I was ashamed by that mini budget and the level of incompetence it showed that the government uh, displayed with it. Um, so I think that that was terrible. It was embarrassing on the national stage. Then we saw Liz Trust lose power after 44 days in office. And we just had a succession of very poor leaders from the Conservative Party and I think people are not stupid you know if they vote if they give you their mandate they expect you to do a good job and people will not forget that they kind of screwed up terribly and this is the party of business or at least it used to be so I think that's a problem and I think it's likely that uh, they'll lose in a landslide short of a miracle um also, I think their, their fundamental problem is they're completely out of touch with very young people in the UK. There are very few conservative voters in the youngest age groups in the UK. It's a very extreme difference if you break it down by age deciles, for example, uh, in voting intention. So that's a problem. You know, why can't they reach younger people, a reasonable number of younger people? And that'll be a problem if they can't. So, you know, the policies are not great. And I think they're out of touch with what most Brits want. And um, even someone who's very pro-business or capitalism like me, uh, you just think, well, how could you do that? How could you screw up so badly and stick a finger up to business? You know, how would you do that? Why would you do that? Given that you're supposedly the party of business. You know, I think that was awful. So I don't think they're going to survive. Um Beyond the next, um, beyond the next election. But what do I know? Look, I'm a financial YouTuber. I'm not a political YouTuber. Um, and even with finance, you know, I don't make predictions. But 
that would be my expectation um, anyway that was that's my hate me's worth um, because it was a super chat thank you uh, next question is is it better to invest in the ETF aggregate bond this is a super chat according to Laura uh, ETF aggregate bond or buy the bond directly from the platform I like the equity ETF PRIW, but I'm not sure about bonds. So why is it um, that I like bonds? Well, single bonds. Um, the first thing I guess to say is let's have a look at them, right? So let's have a look at them and just see what the deal is. Let's just recap. Let's have a look at the macroeconomic tracker here so as a member you get access to these trackers these are updated every day thanks to my colleague Patrick who um, updates them and this is the UK gilt yield curve right now so let's just kind of dive into this a little bit because um, it is I think useful to know this stuff uh, let me move my face over here All right so what are these blobs? So this is the maturity of the bonds in the UK. So these are UK gilts issued by the UK government to raise cash up to a maturity of 50 years. So it goes from zero years up to 50 years. Each of the blobs is one bond. The y-axis tells you their yield, assuming that you buy the bond today and hold it to maturity. There is a secondary assumption with yield to maturity, which is that you can reinvest the coupon payments at that same yield, which is often not true. But if the yields are small and the maturity date isn't too far in the future, that's not far off just an annualised return for the coupon payments and the principal that you've got for the bond. So what do we earn for that? Right. So usually this would be upward sloping. So you get very little yield at the short end of the curve because you're not taking much duration risk. You get lots of yield at the longer end of the curve because you're being compensated for buying something which is very volatile. At the moment, you're being paid to take very little risk. What's happened over the last few months is that the hump here at 20 years to 30 years has gone from very low. It's kind of grown a pot belly at the 20 to 30 year point such that the yield now at the 20 to 30 year points is roughly the same at the zero end of the curve. So if you buy this TG24 bond, for example, you're going to get 1% in income and you're going to get 4% in capital gain annualised between now and when the date of the maturity of the bond is, which is in April of 2024, April the 22nd. So let's look it up. Let's look up TG24. Um, and we'll look it up on the London Stock Exchange. Here we go. So here's the bond. And here's its price on the LSE. So today it was trading at um, 98. So the bid and offer price, you pay the 97.98 price. So you pay about 98 quid. Ninety-eight pounds. Now, when it matures, it's going to be at hundred pounds. They always mature at hundred. So, if you hold to maturity, you're guaranteed to get a hundred pounds in on April the twenty-fourth in twenty twenty-two. So, you know to the penny what you're going to get. You pay ninety-eight, ninety-seven pounds and ninety-eight pence today, plus any accrued coupon, and then at maturity, you get a hundred pounds back. So you know exactly what you're going to get. You never need to sell the bond because you just wait to maturity. And you know what yield you're going to get because that's locked in today. So that's the beauty of it. You're never going to make a loss on this bond. If yields double, if they quadruple, the price of the bond will temporarily fall, but it'll still get pulled up to 100 at maturity. So you, all you'll feel is regret that you didn't buy it at a higher yield, at a lower price but you'll never make a loss. You know exactly what yield you'll get, regardless of what happens to the yield curve, if you hold it to maturity. And you've got the choice to do that. So 
firstly, you get away with not having to pay the bid offer spread. You don't have to sell it and pay more money to a broker. And then also, by waiting to maturity, you know exactly how much you're going to get at maturity. So that's why I like these, because they're predictable. They've got almost no credit risk. And, you know, the UK government's very unlikely to default on its debts. And, of course, you know exactly what you're going to get. So predictable, low risk, but low return, of course, but much higher return than we had previously. So I think that's... Okay. That's primarily why I like these things. Um, so that's why I think it's usually better to buy single bonds, at least I like to, because you know exactly what you're going to get and there's no loss involved. For example, in 2022, when we had that huge fall in bonds, in 2023, sorry, when we had this huge fall in bonds, you wouldn't have suffered that if you'd have bought single bonds, assuming you didn't buy them at zero yield or negative yield. So that's the beauty of it. Um, so personally, yeah, I mean, all of this, all of the bonds I buy now are usually single bonds. So I've got one left, one of them matured, a gilt. And I've got one inflation linked bond, which is going to mature next year. So I'm quite excited about that because I'll see whether my assumptions about inflation were anywhere near true. Because unlike with nominal bonds, with inflation linked bonds, you also get the uplift from RPI inflation. So if inflation is more than is baked into the bond, you make extra money for the inflation increase. So we'll just have to see what happens to RPI inflation between now and then to see what the yield will be. So you don't know exactly what you'll get with linkers. For normal government bonds, you do know what you're going to get, which is beautiful. So I think, yeah, that was from Fabio uh, Crispignano, who uh, did that super chat. I hope that answers your question, uh, Fabio. But anyway, I did a whole video about uh, buying gilts and why it's attractive and how to do it. Uh, so please watch that. It's available on YouTube. And I did a more detailed one for members, which is available on our, if you have a premium website membership, which you can find out more about at pensioncraft.com. Great. There's a super chat from uh, Baskivis one off. 2009. Baskivis one off. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, love your videos. Thank you. Where to park money for three months safely with best returns? Ah, that was good. Yes. I contacted HSBC, but they offer money market funds only for companies. Bah. The thing is, any of these brokers will um, give you an ETF and you know, there are at least six ETFs in the UK, which are money market funds. The one which a lot of the pension crafters like is CSH2, but there are many others. Um, so particularly now, because companies can see that people want money market funds because they're giving a pretty good yield for very low risk. So I think there'll just be more of them issued, if anything. And the fees on them are very low. So, you know, there are lots to choose from. You don't have to have one from HSBC uh, unless that's the platform you're forced to use. Uh, but, you know, let's have a look. I mean, there are lots to choose from. Uh, let's see, there was a chat I did on, on Slack recently which talked about these. Uh, money market. Occasionally I kind of show this to members um, and update it. Yeah, here we go. So if I share that, I'm going to have to share a different screen. One second. Can I share the other screen? No. OK. Let me move that over there. Just talk amongst yourselves. There we go. Here we go. So this is uh, the message I shared on Slack. So here you can see six different money market funds which are available in the UK. And what I was trying to show is that they all track the Sonia rate, which is the Sterling Overnight Index Average Rate, pretty closely. And they very rapidly pick up that higher interest rate when 
the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England raises rates. That pushes up Sonia and it pushes up the rate you return, the rate of return on these money market funds. So the way I calculate these, these are all accumulation funds. I work out the change in price over the last 22 days and I annualize it. So this is the annualized 22 day return for six UK money funds, UK money market funds. CSH2 is the one that's popular with members, uh, pension craft members. That's returning about 5.4%. Um, XTISA from BlackRock, that's returning 5.2%. Another one from BlackRock, MyACKR, that's returning 5.7%. Um, and Legal and General's got one, that's returning just over 6 Royal London's got one. This is a fund, not an ETF. That's returning about 6.8, but you can see it had a kind of jump upwards recently. I don't know why. And then there's a Vanguard one, which is returning about 5.7. So, you know, those are the kind of choices you've got. There are lots of them. Um, so all I'd say is, you know, if you can if you can use another platform, it sounds like you might not be able to, but if you can, then, you know, there are lots of money market funds out there. They all give pretty much the same return. I just find one with a super low fee. So the fee, fee for the cheapest is about 0.1%. They're very cheap funds, usually. Um, hope that helps. A um, uh, question from Dan Veneri. Nice to see you, Dan. Uh, he's one of our supporters on YouTube. He says, hi, Roman. Hope you're doing great. Apple CEO Tim Cook sold five and a half. 511,000 shares, which were worth about 88 million before accounting for taxes. Is this a sign to a possible stock crash? Maybe. Maybe he needs the money for something. You know, it's possible that it's just, uh, you know, he, he wants to buy a new house. He wants to have his kitchen redesigned for $88 million. Who knows? It's impossible to know. Uh, but, but is this a reliable signal that markets are about to crash? Probably not. I mean, the guy is not going to, it's not going to make any difference to his wealth whatsoever, I suspect. Uh, he's going to be comfortably wealthy until the day he dies. So, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it's to do with a potential crash. Um, is Apple overvalued? Well, let's take a look. I think that's a much better thing to look at. Um, again, we can use Yardini here. Uh, magnificent seven. Oh, it's the Mega Cap 8. Okay. <laughs> Let's have a look at Apple. Uh, Yardini, here we go. Apple. Can I do that? No. Apple. Apple, Apple, Apple. It does individual stocks here as well. Here we go. So Apple is currently, it's price to sales, price to earnings. Apple is 25.9. So it's certainly not the most expensive. The most expensive is Amazon. By the look of it. Yep, so Amazon is 43 times forward earnings. And you have to, you see I had to cap the graph at 100. <laughs> 100 times forward earnings. Uh, and bear in mind that the S&P 500 as a whole was 17.7. So all of these are looking quite toppy. Uh, Meta is the only one that's not looking super expensive. Tesla, 58. Okay. Um, Netflix, 26. But yeah, Apple's not incredibly expensive, but quite expensive. Uh, I am colorblind, unfortunately, so I'm not too sure. I can read off 26. So that's about... Here, isn't it? So Apple's one of these. I think that's green. I'm not sure. So it hasn't been one of the ones that went completely mad. And it, remember, what pushed these stocks up was partly the narrative about AI. Tesla's always got a non-going, a kind of ongoing narrative about Elon. Oh, I'm not showing the screen. I can hear from downstairs. Oh, that's because. Oh, wait a minute. Order, centre back, move down. No, 
Actually, I've lost the ability to share my screen. That's not good, is it? I made myself smaller. No, it's not working. No. But if I move that. Oh, yeah, here we go. I'll make that big. I'll make me small. Now, this is professionalism in action, isn't it? I don't know what I did, but it wasn't good. Okay, shrink me down. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so this is this is the kind of comparison of all the mega cap eight um, tech stocks. Uh, yeah, the green one, which is the one I can't see, is down here somewhere. And um, yeah, so Apple is down here 26 times. The one that's crazily high is Amazon still. Amazon was kind of bumping along the 100 times cap up at the top here for a long time. Um, and Tesla obviously has been bumping along at the top until recently as people realized it was crazily overvalued. So uh, is Apple crazily overvalued at the moment? No, but it's pretty high given that the average for the S&P is around 17.7. Mm. So yeah, that's all I'd say. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going. I don't think it's a signal. So, so when the CEO sells, it's usually just because they need cash. Uh, another question from Baskis, Baskivis Swanath, Baskivi Swanath. I think that's how you pronounce it. Baskivi Swanath, two thousand and nine. Would you invest in India for the next decade? The PE is high. In fact, it's. I think it's more expensive than the US right now. Do they correlate highly? I think the reasons why they're expensive are different. Apparently, as I understand it, in India, because there are capital controls and because there are taxes for buying bonds, which are quite attractive, Indian bonds, I think you don't have much choice. You have to buy stocks. So if you are wealthy, if you have savings, you have to buy Indian stocks. And I think there are problems buying international stocks if you are Indian. So I think this is just a reflection of the fact that Indian people don't have much choice. Um, personally, I think that you know valuations at the moment probably look a bit stretched for the for, for India. Um, but do they correlate highly? Probably not. You know, I think it's different reasons driving valuations up. In the US, remember, it was a narrative about AI largely. In the um, in India, it's due to restrictions on on capital. I think. Plus a kind of exuberance, you know, people are very optimistic about the prospects for the Indian economy, which are probably justified. You know, I think it's if I had to choose a country which is looking great um, over the kind of mid to long term. Yeah, India looks great at the moment, but the valuations would kind of put me off at the moment. Uh, but if there was a crash in India, I think that could be quite an attractive buying opportunity. Uh, but the valuation puts me off because it's mean reversing. So there's a super chat as well from Scipio Africanus. You're a great emperor, by the way. I think you were badly maligned. I invest in 100% equities, 85% MSCI World, 10% MSCI EM, which is roughly market cap weighting, 5% MSCI small cap, okay? Do you believe in the small cap allocation, the small cap allocation will be worthwhile long term? Yeah, personally, I do. You know, I've got small caps in my portfolio, but I bought them because they were cheap. And this is US small caps via the S&P 600, which has a profitability filter. So the UK small caps, which I've bought, there wasn't a small cap value UK fund. So I made my own. So I had to use single stocks to build my own fund. I combined value with size, so I got got small cap value, with momentum, so earnings momentum, uh, which is improving, so improving profits and improving price, and quality, which is another measure which looks at things like leverage and um, 
earnings growth, for example. So I combined all of those factors to create something that Stockopedia called a super stock, and uh, that's what I went for. Uh, so this is my filter. So I did a video about this recently as well. Let's see if I can share this with you. Now that I've fixed my sharing. Okay, screens. Come on. Is that frozen? I think it has. There we go. So this is what I'll share. There we go. So this is showing you the filter I chose. So these are the criteria up at the top here. Let me make that bigger. So the criteria I chose, they have a ranking system of a value. So high ranking is cheap. So value rank greater than 80, quality rank greater than 60. So that wasn't such a stringent filter. Momentum, which is both for earnings and for price, that was above 80. And then we've got a lower lower range. So micro caps are excluded, less than 100 million market cap and more than a billion. So those are excluded. So these are UK small caps and I've sorted these by stock rank. And you can see the stock rank of all of them is above 93. So I didn't buy junk stocks because when you're buying value, the question is always, are you buying stocks which are cheap today, but which will recover? And by, by having a quality filter, hopefully I'm avoiding value traps, which are cheap and going to stay cheap because they're just lousy companies. So anyway, I made a video about that. And if you want to see how to use Stockopedia, um, you can do that. And we've also got a promotional link so that you get a discount on your, on your Stockopedia um, subscription if you decide to go for it. And by the way, that's not just for the UK. You, you can also get Stockopedia for Asian stocks, US stocks. And in fact, I think it covers every region. Um, so let me go back to your questions. Um, so yeah, small caps worth it long term. Scipio Africanus. Mr. Hanlon, last one, supporter. Uh, sorry, I just joined. So skip if you're covered, if you've covered this. How do you feel about US bonds at the moment? Overreaction? I uh, did kind of cover it, but you know, no point in re uh, no harm in recapping. Um, I think yields may go higher, but you know, they come. There comes a point when you get U.S. Treasuries for something like you know six percent yield, and you think, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would, because it's U.S. Treasuries, right? Brilliant. So if you can get a pretty high yield, then. I think at a certain point, people are just going to buy it, buy into it, and that's going to push down yields. OK, the Fed has stepped out of the market as a buyer of uh, price insensitive buyer of US Treasuries. That's not good. There's been a lot of issuance le recently uh, that may come or at least start to slow down. Um, but, you know, I think overall, at a certain point, yields become so attractive that people will just pile into it international buyers remember because it's institutional buyers which drive most of the flow for treasuries and if you're a japanese investor and you're yield starved well it suddenly looks very attractive to buy us uh, treasuries at six percent yield so you know i think that'll just push down yields and that'll be a cap on yields because yields elsewhere uh, will have to rise um so it may push up yields elsewhere, but I think those bond buyers from other countries will push down the, the yields in the US. That will be a stabilizing factor as international buyers buy US treasuries. Um, but could it go to 6%? Yeah, it's possible. Would it go to 10%? Very unlikely. I saw someone talking about 13. That's way out. I think that's extremely unlikely over the you know next year or so. Anyway, look, that's it. We've been together for over an hour now. So thank you for your time and your, your, your attention. Remember, if you want a one-to-one -one, a one -to -one with me, you can do that. Go to our website, pensioncraft.com. If you want to become a member of our community, a premium online membership, you can go to pensioncraft.com to learn more about that. And um, you get access to Slack, members-only videos, and also... Um, those trackers which I've been using today. 
which I think some people find quite helpful. And uh, please do like, share and subscribe to our channel. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll meet again in the near future. Take care, everyone.